You will hear a woman called Britt Foxton talking about women's basketball. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences with a word or short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 2. Hi, my name's Britt Foxton, and I'm the founder of a website devoted to women's basketball, and I've also just written a book on the same subject. But first up, let me tell you how I got started with the site. Although it really got going once I was at university, it actually started out as a high school project. You know, a designer website kind of thing. But it wasn't like anyone expected it to become real or anything. I designed a site about girls' basketball, which I was passionate about, and called it femalebasket.com. I knew the name wasn't right, and before it got really successful, I changed it to matchgirl.com, and that was a really good move. And although it started with basketball, the site's kind of evolved to include other games as well. It features a variety of articles, reviews and editorials on everything ranging from basketball to computer games, plus a smattering of more traditionally girly material as well. But the coverage of team sports is at the heart of it. Anything about makeup or fashion is just peripheral. Then there's my book. That was a quite different sort of challenge. It's on the subject of girls' basketball and overall took about three months to do. I knew I wanted to write it late last year and started to loosely plan it out in January of this year. It wasn't until May that I had enough time to get down to doing everything I'd envisioned, but it was all done by the end of July. And in researching the book, I came across some pretty interesting facts. Like, women actually began playing basketball less than a year after the men's game was invented back in 1892. It didn't become an Olympic sport until 1976, however, whereas the men's game was in there from 1936. And that tells you a lot about how it developed. People asked me whether we'd recognise the game the way it started or if it's changed. Well, the biggest difference is in clothing. Back then, in the USA, women were required to play in full-length dresses. The only body parts that could be exposed were fingers, necks and heads. And it wasn't only the discomfort they suffered, it led to quite a few broken bones because players tended to trip over their skirts and stuff. <laughs> of course, no way did the men have these problems. Then, at the end of a woman's game... There'd be, like, handkerchiefs and hairpins scattered all over the court, which, of course, wasn't the case with the men, either. So you can see how the two developed in quite different ways, even with a differently sized court for many years. Of course, things did change, but quite slowly, really. Appropriate clothing came in gradually, but even well into the 20th century, some other rules applied to women, but not to men. Not so much the equipment, but silly things like chewing gum was specifically prohibited in the women's game because it was considered unfeminine, not because it was dangerous or anything. And I've got some good stories from those years in the book, I think. Like when in 1936, a team of women basketball players called the Red Heads toured the country playing exhibitions against men's teams. Strange thing was, though, these girls not only had to wear the same clothes, they all had to have red hair. Most of them had to dye it specially. Isn't that unbelievable? But looking back on the writing of the book, if I did it again, I'd do it all differently. I know I ought to be proud of what I've done, but I'm such a perfectionist. Given the chance, I'd add significantly more information on the cultural traditions and really address the growing basketball fan base. But who knows? Maybe there's another book in there somewhere. Now, before I show you some of the wonderful... Now play the recording again. That is the end of part two. Now turn to part three.